When I think of chocolate, I think of this. But in the 18th century, if you would have asked for chocolate, you would have gotten a nice warm cup of chocolate for breakfast. They did have chocolate confectionery, chocolate candies, chocolate creams, chocolate puddings, or even chocolate tarts, but most chocolate was consumed as a chocolate drink. From the 17th century and into the 18th century, chocolate in Europe was for the rich. It was expensive, but it turns out that chocolate in North America was actually rather inexpensive, and it wasn't just for rich people, but middle class and even some poor people enjoyed chocolate. It always amazes me that we get this rich, wonderful flavor from this odd little bean. This is the cacao bean. This is where chocolate starts. The cacao bean comes from Central America, but it isn't until the Spanish arrive that it turns into the chocolate that we know of. They start to add things like sugar and spices to it, and then it becomes the chocolate we know. Chocolate starts to come into North America in the 17th century and gets very popular in the 18th century. There are dozens and dozens of chocolate manufacturers in North America based in Boston, New York, Rhode Island, and Philadelphia. They get the raw cacao beans and they process them into wonderful chocolate, mostly eaten here in North America, some of it being exported out, maybe even smuggled into Europe because it was cheaper and a better quality. I'm so excited about this recipe today because we're gonna be making this chocolate drink using the process just like they would have done in the 18th century. We're gonna start with our raw cacao beans and process it all the way through till we get to our drink. The recipe or process today comes from The Domestic Coffee Man. It's a book about coffee, tea, and chocolate. And it's funny that the first recipe or the first whole process that he talks about is chocolate before he even gets to coffee. Chocolate is that important. And the process in the book starts from the very beginning. How do you process your beans? We find our raw beans and they were particular about their beans. They wanted to know exactly where they came from. Just like today, when we know that certain kinds of coffee flavors come from beans from certain regions, they knew the same thing about chocolate. They were more particular about their chocolate than they were their coffee. So the process all starts with this cacao bean, and it comes out of a cacao pod, sort of like an avocado, but filled with these strange beans on the inside. They gather those up, they smash them, and they ferment them, and they get these beans out and dry them and then they're shipped to whoever's gonna manufacture this chocolate. In the 18th century, they'd take these beans and they would cook them just like we cooked our coffee beans in our coffee episode. So we're gonna take them in a pan, put them over a low heat and start stirring them. These raw beans are interesting. They have a smell that is reminiscent to chocolate, but you might not catch it immediately. And if you cut it open and taste a little bit of this, it really doesn't have a real chocolatey flavor. I think that comes out when we roast them. The domestic coffee man talks about how long to roast them. Let them roast over a clear charcoal fire, keep them continually moving, or if they stand and they burn, they're spoiled. Neither roast them too much, at least they spoil that way, but so that the shells and hulls are being broken and that they may easily fall off. That's the trick. How do we get the shells on the outside of this bean, the husk, to release? I think this part of the process might be the hardest. These husks do not just pop off of these. On the coffee beans, they naturally kind of fly off. But on these cocoa beans, you've got to kind of do it by hand. And that was done in the 18th century. People had to hand shell these little beans after they were roasted. And sometimes it works and sometimes the bean disintegrates in your hand. So it's trickier than it looks. You might look at this chaff or shells as they would call them in the 18th century and think, this is something I'd throw in the fire or throw it in the trash. Turns out, this is something really special. I'll use these at the end of the video, so hang on. The next step is to take this chocolate, mix it with sugar, and form it up into its final shape. 
we're gonna use this slab of marble. We're gonna warm it up and put this on, mix it up, and you'll see what happens. There are some incredibly complicated recipes for chocolate in the 18th century that include many, many spices. And this is just for drinking chocolate. They might have cinnamon. In fact, many, many recipes would have cinnamon. Long pepper, uh, nutmeg, yeah, you'll find that in chocolate, aniseed, and even vanilla. In fact, in Hannah Glass's cookbook, which is the most popular cookbook in the 18th century, the only recipe that includes vanilla is for chocolate. So here's our little chocolate brick after it has solidified. And you have to make this in a cool weather. You can't make this in the hot summertime or else it will never solidify. This is the kind of thing you would buy in the store. And these would come in like large bar form. To make this into the chocolate drink that everyone enjoyed in the 18th century, this was ground up into your chocolate pot heated over a fire with water in it and you'd use a special little mulling stick that's what we're gonna do now. This is smelling great. It's a little too hot to drink. And I mentioned the shells earlier. I said I was gonna talk about the shells. Here are shells. Um, this would be something you'd throw out maybe, but it turns out that you can take these shells and you can use them just like a tea. We're gonna steep them like tea and make a drink. This was actually a popular drink in the late 18th century. Martha Washington requested 20 pounds of cocoa shells so that she could make her own special chocolate drink. We've got not one, but two drinks to try. This one looks very rich, like it's full of cream and milk. It's not, it's just our chocolate with the water. Um, and it smells great. Let's give it a try. That's really, it's different than uh, hot cocoa that you would get today. It's got both a, a smell and a definite flavor that's a lot more coffee-like. It's got a little bit of that bitterness to it that coffee has, but not in a bad way whatsoever. And the domestic coffee man talks about that. Depending on the kind of beans you're using, you may have to add a little more sugar or less sugar. That kind of takes the edge off the bitterness. But I can see exactly why they would drink this instead of coffee or as a great coffee substitute because it's so very, very close to that kind of flavor profile. Here's what I really want to find out. What's this Martha Washington chocolate tea like made out of the shells of coffee? Sort of the refuse, which you would throw away. And it's definitely more subtle. And you saw it pouring out, right? It's, it's not that super, you know, rich, chocolatey color but a much more like a chocolate tea wow um, you know I enjoy uh, a regular chocolate tea in the morning I actually have that as one of my morning uh, things and I think this would make a really good replacement for it if I had shells all the time to make it if you'd like another great colonial drink try this flip recipe <laughs> 